This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, and uh, I, as much as all of you, understand the importance of this forum and the importance of the relationships uh, that are formed. Uh, we're joined by a number of leaders from around, throughout uh, North America, uh, which is going to help us remain that vibrant uh, economic force that we are right now. And I think today's partnership and today's discussions and today's ideas will help us even further that goal more. Now, I'd like to extend a special welcome to everybody, but I'd just be going back over exactly the same list, uh, trying to do another one clap while you're eating. So I'm not going to do that, but I would like to say we're uh, very happy to have the Secretaries of Commerce from uh, all three nations here to help us in this discussion. Uh, the purpose of this conference is obviously to advance innovation and competitiveness, uh, not only among our three countries, but collaboratively. And I think that's one of the important things that we're uh, really talking about. In San Diego, this just isn't an abstract concept with us. Uh, we actively work with our partners from Canada and Mexico on a daily basis through our border. Uh, Mexico is the state's largest trading partner and the top consumer of our state's imports. Uh, we have binational businesses and families and for whom daily life takes place on both sides of our border. Uh, we share culture, we share families, we share air, we share water. Uh, and we share a common interest in this region. From our city's government to our city's business leaders, San Diegans are grappling with some of North America's most pressing issues when it comes to international trade and commerce. And these issues really revolve around border efficiency and also the investments we need to make in a green economy. With uh, conferences like this one, uh, we're showing that working together not only benefits us individually, but benefits all of us together. So once again, thank you all for being here, and thank you for uh, being a part of this discussion to find out how we can work uh, in a more mutually beneficial way. Thank you. To introduce our keynote luncheon speakers, from our title sponsor, Semper Energy, please welcome the President and Chief Operating Officer, Neil Schmalley. Thank you. It's, the, it's a real honor for me, on behalf of Semper Energy, uh, to in, introduce our distinguished guests today. Semper Energy is heavily involved in cross-border activities between the United States and Mexico. We have new, nearly $2 billion of investments in natural gas infrastructure in northern Mexico, and of course, significant investments in the San Diego region. So probably as much as any company, uh, we, are, we are heavily committed to the, the cross-border economies in this region. I'd like, now like to introduce the secretaries. Secretary Gerardo Ruiz Mateos was appointed Secretary of the Economy by President mm -hmm. Felipe Calderon in 2008 and is charged with fostering economic growth and investment in Mexico. One of Secretary Ruiz Mateo's top priorities is the development of a robust economy where all Mexicans have access to a better life. Prior to this current post, the Secretary served as coordinator of cabinets and special projects for President Calderon. He coordinated the activities of the various cabinets to meet the President's overall goals and developed long-range strategic plans for the Mexican federal government. He also oversaw special projects assigned by the president and previously held the position of head of the president's office. Minister Tony Clement was appointed Minister of Industry in Canada in 2008 
and is responsible for economic development in Canada. The minister focuses on several key sectors in the economy, including encouraging investment in Canada and fostering scientific research and discovery. He was first elected to the House of Commons in 2006 and re-elected in 2008. During this time, he served as Minister of Health and Minister for the Federal Economic Development Ish Initiative for Northern Ontario. Prior to running for federal office, he was a member of Ontario's provincial legislature from 1995 to 2003, and he served the people of Ontario in a variety of roles, including as Minister of Transportation, Minister of the Environment, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. United States Secretary of Commerce, Gary Locke, was appointed by President Barack Obama in 2009. He directs efforts to promote trade and entrepreneurship and foster technological breakthroughs that will help America retain its leading role in the global economy. As the first Chinese American to hold his post, Secretary Locke has a distinctly American story. His grandfather emigrated from China initially finding employment as a servant and working in exchange for English lessons. Secretary Locke's father, also born in China, was a small business owner operating a grocery store where Secretary Locke worked while receiving his education from Seattle's public schools. As, as I read this, I, I noted a, a note of, of, of personal interest to me uh, whereas uh, Secretary Locke's grandfather came to the United States to work in exchange for English, uh, English lessons, I now have a son who, like Secretary Locke, went to Yale and is now working in rural China for the princely sum of $150 plus, plus Mandarin lessons, uh, <laughs> teach, teaching English. So yeah, there's, there's something about that in globalization. I, I don't know quite what it is, but I found it very interesting. As governor of the, of the state of Washington, he is credited with helping more than double the state's exports to China to over $5 billion per year. Secretary Rees, Mateos, Secretary Locke, and Minister Clement, it truly is a great honor for San Diego and the region to have the leading economic ministers of North America all in one room. Thank you for being here, and uh, please join me and, and take your seats on the stage. <laughs> Secretary Ruiz Mateos will begin with a discussion of how to make the 21st century North America's century through competitiveness in a global economy. Thank you. Mr. Gary Locke, United States Secretary of Commerce, Tony Clement, Canada Minister of Industries, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank to the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, the University of California, the University of San Diego, and the sponsoring companies for their work in organizing this trinational conference. As a Secretary of Economy, I celebrate all efforts aimed to foster cooperation between our countries. Now more than ever, it is crucial that the academia, experts, private sector, and governments of North America engage in a constructive dialogue for its future. The United States, Canada, and Mexico are, exp uh, are experiencing serious challenges on competi competitiveness that needs to be addressed with haste as a region with North, with North America in mind. In this decade, the world has become more regionalized, and unfortunately, in North America, we have not responded to this global reality as the, as, as the times have demanded. While other regions like Europe and Asia have accelerated the, their uh, pace towards economic integration, we have been moving 
either very slowly or painfully mm -hmm. in opposite direction. While in Europe, 75% of its trade is interregional, inter in North America, it's only 50%. Since 2000, North America has lost more than 30% of its shares of the world exports. Our, tra our trade has increased, but not at the rate of other regions. We cannot allow this situation to continue. We have to foster economic growth, and our best way to do it is by improving the regional competitiveness. It is not the only a question of moving forward, but it's also to do faster than on others. North America is a full of economic opportunities. NAFTA has proved to be an important trigger of, of our economy potential. The trilateral trade increased from $280 billion uh, dollars in 1993 to nearly a trillion dollars in 2008, uh, in 2008, and a run of 40 million jobs was created in the region in this period of time. It is a reality that our countries complement each other for geographical, economical, economic, demographic, and cultural reasons. Our economies are strategic allies because while you are capital intensive, we are labor intensive. We also have a demographic complementaries due to the youth of the Mexican population, which is uh, 27 year old, the average age in Mexico. Even our comparative advantages for producing agricultural products are mutually enriched. The United States and Canada are very competitive producing grains and cereals, while Mexico has a, compar a comparative advantage growing fruits and vegetables. And Mexico industry platform has lower production cost to 30% for firms investing in sectors such as aerospace, automotive, and telecommunication equipments. NAFTA has shown us how this complementary contribute to our prosperity. Yet, we need to move forward to a post-NAFTA competitiveness agenda to promote more fluent trade flows among our countries. Above all, above all we must reduce the transaction costs for a trade community. That's why, since the beginning of the administration of President Calderon, we have worked with an, our American and Canadian counter, counterparts in a common competitive, competitiveness agenda. We have made import, important progress in identifying the priorities to reduce the time and cost of moving goods across our borders, as well as to improve and harmonize our regulation. We are committed with bringing up our border infrastructure that needs our 21st century. NAFTA multiplied our trade flows. For example, in the last 10 years, we did not construct the crossing infrastructure required. While trade between Mexico and United States grew four uh, more than four times, the infrastructure grew only 25%. This year, we have made important inroads. Last January, we inaugurated the Ansaldúas Bridge in Tamaulipas. And in 2010, we will inaugurate two more in Sonora and Tamaulipas, and will further the works of a very promising project for a pedestrian beach that will con uh, connect the airports of San Diego and Tijuana. Where 60% uh, of our exports and 11% of our imports cross to this border. It is imperative that we overcome the bottleneck that ineff the inefficient cross-border transport freight services have created. Transport are fundamental to our regional competitiveness. The liberalization of these services among our countries established in NAFTA is a long due. This uh, remains in, uh, a blemish in NAFTA, otherwise very su successful record. To increase and improve our trade, it is essential to build an efficient border and competitive regulation. Now that all the tariffs have been eliminated in our trade, it is important that we work towards that the harmonization of the requirements and the standards to our goods uh, needs to be uh, needs to comply with. There, uh, the more such requirements and tests for compliances are alike the same in North America, the less trading cost will affect business. 
The U.S. Department of Commerce has estimated that the companies could save 7% of their cost if more progress is made in this front. Additionally, of course, we must work together in endorsing regional production innovation projects, improving protection of intellectual and property rights, responding to a climate change via initiatives like North American cap and trade and development of renewable and clean energies, and also promoting North American exports and recruiting more small business, small business to these activities. In the last State of the Union, President Obama announced his new exports initiative with the goal of doubling U.S. exports in the next, uh, in the next five years. We are looking forward to contribute to achieve this goal. Canada and Mexico can be a strategic partner to the success of this initiative because our complementaries are the high integrated supply chains, lower production costs, a specialized labor force, and geographic proximity. To give you an example of this positive link between Mexico GDP and U.S. exports growth, if Mexico grows 4.5% in 2012, that is the projection, as it has been estimated, U.S. export of electrical equipment will increase $1.6 billion. Current truck export uh, will amount an extra of $1.2 billion. And we have many of examples how the Mexican market contributes to the exports of United, Sta of United States. Dear friends, our countries share a common challenges, and therefore, we should work on our common solutions. It is time to move faster the second stage of cooperation aimed to make our region the world's most competitive one. We depend in our capacity to join efforts and to reach agreements that will benefit business, create jobs, and promote the well-being of Mexicans, Americans, and Canadians. Thank you very much. If, if Minister Command will indulge me for one moment, I forgot to mention that there are cards on your tables that if you want to ask a question later, if you will please write the questions out and then uh, we, uh, when, they, when we finish, we will pick them up and uh, those will be the questions that we may have time to ask. So uh, forgive me for uh, interrupting the program, but Minister Tony Clement. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It certainly is uh, just a great pleasure uh, to be here today and uh, to be joined by my uh, colleagues, uh, Secretary Locke and uh, Secretary Ruiz, uh, to have uh, some important discussions while you were working uh, this morning on uh, your uh, very important issues in this conference. We were hard at work as well, uh, going through a few issues ourselves and making sure we were all coordinated in our respective uh, roles and responsibilities, not only for now, but in the weeks and the months ahead as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't I also thank the organizers of this uh, wonderful conference. I really, uh, what a terrific job in terms of the uh, speakers, uh, uh, the agenda itself. It says in my notes this, the speakers are first rate, which uh, sounds a little bit too self-congratulatory. Maybe we'll find out after my speech is over whether we can still say that or not. Uh, but uh, certainly the, the issues are very uh, timely, so I just wanted to thank the organizers, and uh, it certainly uh, has been a revelation to be here at the uh, University of San Diego. What a lovely, lovely campus, and uh, what a great way to, uh, to carry on the memory of the Kroc family to have this uh, wonderful institute uh, named after Joan Kroc and uh, after her, uh, her bequest. So um, uh, I always like to come to San Diego. By the way, I was in north of the Arctic Circle on the weekend before I got here. So it's doubly nice to be in San Diego. Uh, they had their spring festival up there, which meant they only had eight feet of snow rather than the usual 16 feet of snow. So uh, a little bit of a change of climate has uh, done me good as well. Uh, we are uh, meeting today at an historic uh, moment uh, and, of course, on an auspicious date. Uh, it was on April 14, 1890, that the Pan-American Union was founded by the first international conference of American states. That was done in Washington, D.C. The, na the name would later change the organization of American states, but the, the purpose of promoting cooperation amongst the Americas remains. And today, across the hemisphere, we are in fact celebrating 
Pan American Day. So it is time to remember our connectedness and indeed our collaboration. Recently, we were reminded of the uh, interdependence not just of the Americas, but of the world as a result of the global economic crisis that was spread across borders, across continents, and indeed across oceans. But that crisis confirmed that in today's integrated economy, no nation, however powerful, stands alone nor can any nation go it alone. So it is indeed appropriate that our focus at this conference should be on strengthening the ties amongst our three nations, on advancing innovation, driving competitiveness, and ensuring a sustainable future for our children and our grandchildren. So today I'd like to take just a few moments to talk about what Canada is doing in these areas and with a particular focus on innovation, how we might work together in the days ahead. Now, as a trading nation, Canada is acutely aware of the importance of innovation to our own competitiveness. As the OECD predicted in a report last summer, innovation will be one of the keys to accelerating economic recovery. And for those countries that get it right, it's an opportunity to reap benefits for decades to come. Now, Canada shares that view. That's why even before the global economic downturn was upon us, we were strengthening our economy by reducing taxes, by paying down debt, and by investing in roads and bridges and waterways and other vital infrastructure. We boosted business conditions by implementing corporate tax reductions that will make Canada a more competitive country in which to do business. Now, just as successful companies must embrace innovation, we believe that successful countries must also promote it. Three years ago, we launched a bold new science and technology strategy that is encouraging for firms to innovate to, and also recognizes the importance of keeping Canadians at the forefront of research and discovery. And of course, providing our people with the opportunity to acquire the skills that they will need to participate in an ideas-based economy. Now, as the recession took hold in earnest, we went one step further. We introduced what we call Canada's Economic Action Plan, which was a comprehensive stimulus initiative, similar to TARP and other uh, measures that were brought about by the U.S. government and Congress, but a comprehensive stimulus initiative to not only look after the immediate need to spur growth and to create jobs, but of course to look to the future as well. We're now into our second and final year of this action plan, and I'll just give you some of the, uh, some of the interesting details perhaps. One of the things we were doing with this plan, of course, was to enhance access to financing by removing some of the restrictions on foreign ownership uh, that still exist. Uh, Canada is an open economy. We're a market economy, but there were still some uh, uh, vestigial uh, remnants of, uh, of um, uh, restrictiveness for uh, other, uh, other uh, foreign investment other than Canadian investment. And so we've, uh, we're removing existing restrictions when it comes to Canadian uh, satellites. Uh, we're also doing so in the uranium sector, and we'll be eventually doing that in the telecom sector. And we are also, as a part of our uh, most recent budget, making it easier for American and other venture capital funds to, uh, to invest in Canadian companies for late-stage research and commercialization initiatives. We've also done something that I think is critically important uh, for... Um, our, our uh, colleagues and friends uh, here today as well. We've created uh, and substantially increased scholarship programs that are there to connect not only our, but other countries' brightest young minds and make sure that they're connected to our savviest entrepreneurs. So when we look at our new postdoctoral fellowship program, we're not only looking at Canadians to, to be part of those postdoc fellowships, but we're inviting Mexicans, we're inviting Americans, Europeans, spent a little bit of time in Canada, 
continue your research. And we don't mind even if you go back to your, your home and native land. That's fine because we know that those, those interconnectedness of those skills that are acquired and those connections in our wonderful research institutions and universities will, will be a net plus to both our country but also the original country as well. We've also created some business-led, and that's important, business-led centers of excellence which fund research in private sector innovation and promote commercialization. And we're fostering those business and tech clusters. I know Secretary Locke, you have spoken about this extensively and we've heard a little bit about what is happening in Mexico in this regard as well. Finally, we're reducing the cost of doing business by eliminating in this year's budget all remaining tariffs on manufacturing inputs and, uh, and equipment. That means machinery and equipment, might mean computer software. All those tariffs are gone as a result of this budget. And what that means is we're the first country in the G20 that has gone that route. We did it unilaterally because we believe in the marketplace and we believe that we can lead by example. And when we go to the G20 meeting in Toronto later on in, in June, we can say to other countries, we believe in open markets. Here's what we've done. How can we now foster this internationally for growth and opportunity? We're also, well, thank you for that. Now, all of these efforts are grounded in the fundamental belief that innovation holds the key not only for our country's recovery today, but to our competitiveness and progress together tomorrow. Now, one area that I want to speak of in a, in a little bit more detail is the digital economy. Indeed, for Canada, creating a digital economy is a key component of our economic strategy, and that will underpin our competitiveness for decades to come. Now, information and communication technologies are as critical to success today as raw materials and transportation were to an earlier time. They are having, even as we speak, of course, a profound impact on businesses large and small, enabling them to better serve their customers near and far. To capture their power and potential, we introduced a whole host of measures that encourage faster adoption, including aggressively expanding broadband to rural and remote communities in our country. Now, as more and more creators and consumers join the digital economy, they also have to be confident that their transactions are safe and that their privacy is secure. That means being free from internet fraud, from counterfeit websites, from spyware and spam. And so we proposed tough new anti-spam legislation aimed at protecting the privacy of Canadians and boosting confidence in the electronic marketplace. And critical to that confidence is ensuring that copyright and intellectual property laws keep pace. And our government intends to modernize Canadian law in these areas in this session of Parliament. We also know that innovation and digital technologies will also play a critical role in two areas that are of particular importance to all three of our countries, manufacturing and more efficient borders. When it comes to manufacturing, we need to aggressively adopt information and communication technologies, embedding them in every aspect of production, every aspect of our businesses, so that we can make our companies even more competitive. And a key part of our manufacturing and making that more competitive is ensuring the free movement of goods across our borders and developing efficient supply chains, both of which, I understand, will be addressed more fully later this afternoon. So let me just say for the moment that these issues, uh, getting the right infrastructure in place for modern borders and effective supply chains will be critical to ensuring a competitive North American economy. Of course, nowhere is the potential for innovation, particularly information communication technology, greater than in moving us towards a low carbon economy. A transition like, that countries like China and India and Brazil are already making. They understand that the green economy is where jobs of tomorrow will be, where the opportunities will come from. Indeed, in a very real sense, where the, uh, where, sense where the future lies. In those efforts, uh, Canada's position is clear. 
We are committed to working with our Mexican and American colleagues in a harmonized approach to climate change. Given the integrated nature of our economies, it just makes sense. So we're going to be continuing to work with you to align our regulatory regimes to ensure a level playing field for our industries while minimizing the compliance costs for industries operating across North America. For our part, Canada has set a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 17 percent from 2005 levels by 2020. That may sound uh, like something you've heard before. That's exactly the same target of the Obama administration. To support innovative solutions, we're investing over $1 billion uh, towards funding that will support clean energy technologies and research, development, and demonstration of the most promising clean tech. This will mean cleaner air for our children, greener jobs for our workers, and a better economic environment for all of us. We've also set the goal of obtaining 90% of our electricity from clean sources by 2020. Today, over 70% of Canada's electricity comes from renewable sources, including hydro, nuclear, wind, solar, waste to energy, and biofuels. We're already the second largest producer of hydroelectricity in the world, with unique expertise in turbines, generators, and transformers, and with more business resources per capita than in any, uh, sorry, with more biomass resources that per capita than any other country, Canada is fast becoming a focal point for global development of bioenergy products and services. So we obviously see the tre tremendous potential of hydrogen and fuel cell technology, and of course we want to not only develop that ourselves, but share the potential and the potential business with our partners. So of course I'm looking forward to working with our partners in Mexico and the USA to address these key challenges. And let me say again that just as I began saying that we're meeting at a historic moment, we know that our economies are now in the process of recovering, still struggling in some areas to get on, a, uh, get on their feet. But I believe that in the midst of some of the lingering uncertainty that we're seeing, we have a unique opportunity to explore ways to strengthen North American competitiveness through innovation. And while it may, may be tempting given the economic challenges to retreat behind walls or put up ramparts against the future, that is precisely what we should not do. History teaches us that protectionism is not the way forward in this hemisphere, and it's not the way forward certainly in an interconnected world. So let us thank you. So let us make this resolution today, on this Pan-American Day, that we as North Americans, as three friends, that we will remain open to trade and commerce, and we will continue to build our common future based on our common interests. Now this year, Canada will be welcoming Mexico and the USA to the North American Leaders Summit. We're also hosting the G8 meeting of uh, highly industrialized countries and also hosting the G20 meeting. I guess we figured after winning 14 gold medals at the Vancouver Olympics, <laughs> we can do anything. <laughs> Sorry, it's required for every uh, speech by a Canadian politician to mention the 14 gold medals at least twice, so I've done that already. But anyway, uh, obviously uh, we're looking very much looking forward to be your hosts for the North American Leaders Summit, the G8 and the G20. And most importantly, though, we're looking forward to the progress we can make together. Because great as our partnership has been for all of these decades, I'm an optimist. I believe that our greatest and brightest days are in the future. Thank you very much. If you have filled out questions cards, would you, while uh, Secretary Locke is coming up, would you just sort of raise your hands and the staff will collect them? Thank you. Secretary Locke. Well, thank you very much uh, for having uh, Minister uh, Ruiz and, uh, uh, or uh, Secretary Ruiz and Secretary, uh, or uh, Minister Clement uh, and myself here at this forum. 
this is really a, his, a historic time, as uh, Minister Clement indicated. And the topic uh, that you're addressing, North American competitiveness, innovation, and clean energy, is most, most timely. Uh, first of all, just it's great to, to be on this incredibly beautiful campus with the great weather uh, here at the University of San Diego. And, and I do want to acknowledge a, a friend of mine from years back in the state of Washington who's now the vice president here for business services and administration, former uh, or retired uh, at Rear Admiral uh, Len Herring. So thank you very much for your great work here uh, and in the state of Washington as well. Uh, I got another housekeeping measure. Uh, one of the organizers of, of this uh, conference is, of course, your San Diego Chamber of Commerce, and uh, a key leader of that is Ruben Morales, and today's his birthday, so uh, happy birthday, Ruben. So. <clears throat> and I have to finally uh, note that uh, Mayor Jerry Sanders is here, and we were having a conversation. Uh, about the U.S. Census, because the Department of Commerce is also responsible for the 2010 Census. And uh, these are the last few days of the push of encouraging uh, American families, uh, individuals, to return the Census form by mail, uh, because we'll be, uh, in, a, in, a, in about a, a few weeks, mounting the door-to-door -door effort to count every person in America. And for every 1% increase in the mail-back response, we save the American taxpayers $85 million dollars by not having to send people door to door. It's very expensive to send people door to door. It's about $57 per household to send someone door to door compared to the 42 cents of mailing back the census form. It's $57 on average to go door to door because the first time we go into your house you, with this beautiful weather and the great opportunities and recreational uh, offerings here, you may not be home. And then we have to go back a second time and you're still not home. And then we go back a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time until we finally connect with you. Uh, but a lot is riding on the census. A lot is riding on the census. Uh, first of all, it's political empowerment. California is on the cusp of perhaps losing a seat in Congress. So if you want to maximize your political representation on the issues you care about in Washington, D.C., you've got to be counted. And of course, the census form will be used to determine the allocation and the drawing of the districts and the boundaries for your own state legislature. You know, the state of Utah in the year 2000 missed out getting one extra seat in the United States House of Representatives by 8,000 people. The 8,000 people were there in the state of Utah, but because they were not counted, they did not get the maximum political representation they were entitled to. Also, uh, some $400 billion a year in federal funds is distributed to cities and uh, states based on the census. The money follows the population. And in a time when cities and states are cutting back on key services, $400 billion a year for transportation, for education, for housing, for public safety, uh, for services to senior citizens is, is an important part of that safety net, so be counted. And the 10 questions that we ask, and the mayor was saying it took uh, his wife just a few minutes to fill it out, 10 questions, less than 10 minutes, and the questions are virtually identical to the questions asked in 1790. Virtually the same as the questions in 1790. Here's another thing, California, for every one person who does not fill out the census form who's not counted, your community will lose $1,700 per year per person for the next 10 years. So if 100 people are not counted, that's uh, uh, $1.7 million for the next 10 years for, for that community. And uh, multiply it by 1,000, and that's a lot of money, a lot of money. Well, anyway, we're here to talk about uh, cooperation uh, among our three great countries. And uh, 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 Secretary Ruiz talked about uh, the benefits of competitiveness uh, by leveraging and linking our economies and our efforts together and how intertwined our economies are and how we need to promote the northern hemisphere uh, to be competitive in this world economy. Minister Clement uh, talked about innovation, uh, especially with respect to digital uh, innovation. I'd like to focus a little bit about energy. And uh, because the international competitiveness of North America in the 21st century will be shaped by how well we innovate but especially in the clean energy sector. There are plenty of people in government, in business, and the media who think this 
statement is overblown. They say that for all the excitement about clean energy, it accounts for only a fraction of the energy production in the world. And they point to forecasts that say even 20 years from now, the world will still depend on fossil fuels for as much as 80% of our energy, which is about the same percentage that we use today. They will tell you, in short, that clean energy may be nice, it might make us feel good, and it might even be worth investing in. But they say uh, to imagine that it can produce a substantial share of the world's energy that powers our factories, our planes, our trains, and our automobiles. They say that to suggest that clean energy can be a significant driver of economic growth and job creation, well, the critics say, it's just not realistic. It can't be serious. Well, I say that if the next few decades of energy policy look like the last few decades, where our will to act on clean energy has risen and fallen with the price of a barrel of oil, then the naysayers may be right. But our challenge is to write a different story, to explain to our uh, constituents, to our investors, and to anyone else who will listen that the development of clean energy and energy efficient technologies could spur one of the greatest economic opportunities of the 21st century. And it could put millions of people to work in high-skilled, high-wage jobs. If the countries on this continent are not willing to grasp this opportunity, other countries around the world are. The Pew Charitable Trust just released a study showing that China attracted $35 billion in private capital to its clean energy industry last year, twice as much as the United States. Look at China's rapid growth over the last three decades. It's a pretty impressive record of identifying promising economic opportunities. We should pay attention. Indeed, the Chinese government is spending almost $9 billion per month developing a clean energy sector. They're doing this not just to address the energy demands of China or to mitigate their uh, production emission of greenhouse gases. They're doing it to be the world's leader and the world's supplier of clean energy and energy efficient technologies. They're doing it because they know it will be the source of millions of jobs for the people of China. And if we don't get our act together, we're going to be watching the capital, the business, and the good-paying jobs ending up in Shanghai or even in Berlin instead of Silicon Valley, Toronto, Mexico City, or any of the cities and areas of our respective countries. So today I want to talk about how we can stop that from happening, how the cities of the other worlds will end up with all the jobs and we don't. Whenever people discuss the economic potential of clean energy, we inevitably hear the phrase green jobs. Well, unfortunately, critics dismiss green jobs as little more than a marketing tool contrived by environmentalists. As President Obama said this past summer, there's a lot of, quote, misinformation that there's somehow a contradiction between clean energy and economic growth, end quote. That's a false choice. Meeting the twin imperatives of rising energy demand and reducing our greenhouse gas output will require nothing less than completely rethinking the way we produce and consume energy. In the, fact, in the next few decades, we're going to rebuild, we're going to need to rebuild and reinvent many of our industrial activities, from power generation to transportation to manufacturing, construction. So when we talk about potential job creation arising from clean energy investments, we're not just talking about someone working for a solar or wind company. We're talking about millions of new blue and white collar jobs. Engineers developing and designing energy efficient lighting, meters, power generating technologies, and factory processes. Mechanics rebuilding outdated electric grids with sensors and controls that monitor and distribute clean energy much more effectively and avoiding brownouts. Construction workers, manufacturing workers producing 
and installing green building materials. The potential for new job creation is astounding. The question is, of course, how do we get from here to this promising energy future? I'm proud to say that since taking office, President Obama has already done more to mitigate climate change and invest in clean energy than any president in U.S. history. Our Recovery Act included $80 billion in clean energy investments that will help double America's renewable energy generating capacity in three years while creating thousands of good paying jobs. And the Commerce Department has, has been playing a lead role in developing this emerging market. One of our technical agencies is helping design the standards for a national smart electric grid. Another agency is developing a new tool to measure carbon emissions. And throughout our department, we're looking to open up international markets for American clean energy companies. These measures, along with others that President Obama has made to invest in a new generation of nuclear power and to drive tough new energy efficiency uh, standards in automobiles, appliances, and consumer electronics are historic. But they are only the beginning of what must be done. Because even these ambitious measures don't address the most fundamental barrier to scaling up a clean energy economy. Dirty fossil fuels are still the cheapest kind of energy. And until that changes, we can't expect businesses that are accountable to shareholders to transition to more expensive clean energy. And we can't expect entrepreneurs to make investments in clean energy solutions that aren't self-sustaining in the marketplace. For some critics, this is all they need to claim that clean energy is an expensive boondoggle. And they can say, quote, just let the market decide when clean energy can compete with fossil fuels on cost, then the market will grow on its own. But our current energy market isn't anything like a real free market that accurately reflects the true cost and benefits of fossil fuels in our societies. Just last year, the National Academy of Sciences released a report showing that America's fossil fuel use costs us about $120 billion a year in health costs, most because of thousands of premature deaths from air pollution. Our oil addiction continues to enrich petro dictators and other countries that actively work against North American economic and security interests. And if the seas keep rising, if floods increase, and droughts spread and last longer, you'd better believe that's going to be bad for business, bad for job creation, and according to a recently re released review by the Pentagon, it will be bad for national security. If we continue on our present course, imagine how many billions of dollars it will cost to protect low-lying areas on the coastal areas in North America and all around the world threatened by rising oceans. So let's be clear. The real cost of our fossil fuel use is much higher than what we're paying to heat our homes or to fuel up our automobiles. Even worse, we actually subsidize the same fossil fuel addiction we're supposedly trying to break. Between the year 2000 and 2000, between the year 2002 and 2008, the United States handed out $72 billion worth of subsidies to fossil fuel industries, almost three times as much as we did for renewable energy. Meanwhile, clean energy investors, investors in America are faced with constant uncertainty. Clean energy credits, tax credits, and subsidies are frequently rewarded or revoked, depending on who's controlling the Congress. And clean energy investments can easily be wiped out by something as simple as OPEC deciding to increase its oil production. Is it any wonder that the last 30 years of clean energy has largely been a story of lots of talk and little action? President Obama seeks to end this destructive cycle once and for all by creating a set of incentives to finally unleash the potential of clean energy. And the centerpiece of the president's strategy is passing a comprehensive legislation that features a price on carbon. This step, more than any other, will send a 
sure market signal to every entrepreneur and business in America that it's safe and profitable to make long-term investments in clean energy. It will make the United States and this entire continent healthier, wealthier, and more secure. And although fossil fuels will still be and still need to be a key part of the world's energy mix in the near term, the medium term, pricing carbon will for the first time create needed certainty in the clean energy marketplace. As expected, critics have lined up to claim with little solid evidence that this type of approach will usher in economic Armageddon. But these claims are unconvincing. Time and time again, over the previous few decades, we've seen vested interests predict disaster upon the passage of sensible environmental and energy regulation, be it the Clean Air Act, be it efficiency standards for appliances and automobiles, or the fight we had over a market-based system to curb acid rain back in the, early 19, in the early 1990s. In every case, those measures cost far less than predicted and ultimately provided tremendous benefits for society. Our Energy Secretary Stephen Chu, who hails from California, likes to tell the story of how when California implemented the first refrigerator efficiency standards in the 1970s, industry went nuts. They warned that the standards couldn't be met at a price that consumers could afford. But once the standards were set in stone, manufacturers had to give up the fight and assign the job to engineers instead of their lobbyists. And today, Today, the average American refrigerator is 10% bigger, 50% cheaper, and uses two-thirds less energy. The message here is simple. When you get the incentives right, the private sector can respond with solutions that are both more effective and more affordable than anyone would have imagined. The same thing is possible when it comes to the development of clean energy. I don't suffer any illusions that this will be easy. In ways we often don't realize our decisions are shaped by our past experience, which makes us believe that what once was always will be. That's why back in 1977, the chairman of Digital Equipment Company, which was then one of the most respected technology companies in the world, made the following statement. He said, quote, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home, end quote. <laughs> 30 years later, more than two-thirds of homes in the United States have a computer. So, well, after a century of fossil fuel use, it's naturally hard for many people to imagine anything different. There are plenty of smart and experienced people saying that our energy future has to look a whole lot like our energy past. It doesn't have to be that way. With the right vision and the right commitment, we can build an energy, a clean energy economy that provides good jobs, that sets this continent up for decades of sustainable economic growth. And everyone here today is playing a part in helping that vision become a reality. Keep up the great work, keep pressing for change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. To close the program, would you please welcome the President and CEO of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, Rupert Brales. Thank you, James. Thank you. I want to thank James and the rest of the Chamber staff, along with uh, uh, staff here at uh, University of San Diego and San Diego Dialogue and our other partners to help, that help put this together. We do have more program to follow, so after the lunch, we'll be going straight across the hall again uh, for our discussions on supply chains and efficiency of the border. And I am just grappling here with a few little tokens of appreciation um, for our distinguished guests. So uh, please join me in thanking uh, Secretary Locke, Minister Clement, and Secretary Ruiz uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. We have a uh, uh, small gifts. Um, I'm sure under any gift limit, they, they're well under any, any gift limit, although they're very stylish. Uh, we have these uh, gifts to Secretary. And
Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to take a photograph, I think, with all of you here. And um, we're going to, this concludes the luncheon. And as I mentioned, the uh, panel will be start starting shortly right across uh, the hall. Thank you all for being here this afternoon.